All right, I have 301. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. As you can see, you are here for hopefully the right place, the genetic geneticist workforce session uh, entitled Challenges and Opportunities. And I'll explain a little bit more um, for those of you who, who want to hear a little more explanation about that before we start. Um, and I'm also going to go over logistics, but here's the basic agenda. Um, we're we're going to go, we'll be strict and we'll end it at one hour, no matter how much um, we've covered or not. I'm going to start with just a quick intro and go over a few logistics for this meeting. Um, Eric Green, the director of NHGRI, will provide the official welcome and some background remarks. And then the main portion of this session will be a moderated discussion with uh, Deborah Gare, who should be up there on your screen, who's the chief of the division of genetics and metabolism at Children's National Hospital in DC. Um, and that'll take about 30, 35 minutes or so. And then at the end, I'll provide either a five or a 10 second wrap up, depending on how much time we have, uh, we have left. So let me stop sharing this now. Um, all right, so again, I'm uh, Ben Solomon. I'm the clinical director of NHGRI. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, the only, I guess, overall remark I wanted to provide other than some tedious logistics is just to mention, to set the stage a little bit about, um, the scope of these sessions. So these sessions uh, started from some discussions that a number of us had, including some leaders of uh, groups like ACMG, ABMGG, NSGC, APHMG, ASHG. I'm sure I'm leaving out some others, but lots of folks who have been dedicated to this challenge uh, for many years. Um, in terms of the scope, and Eric's going to define this a little further, but we're really interested in folks who are, I guess, ABMGG or similar, similarly certified as physician geneticists, or you might call them clinical laboratory geneticists, so those two groups. We don't mean to exclude other groups who are involved in this field, such as a cardiologist who works in genetics areas or genetic counselors. We want to learn about a lot from those groups, but we don't want to boil the ocean. You know, in a nutshell, my overarching question or our overarching question is, how do we bring more people into the field? And how do we ensure that the field is vibrant and diverse going forward? So I'm gonna leave it at that for now. I just wanna go over just a handful of quick logis logistics. First, uh, this meeting will be recorded and will be available on the NHGRI YouTube uh, and website. The first session from uh, a couple weeks ago is already available there if you wanna go back and listen to it. If you rejoined, thank you for coming to the second session. We're gonna ask some polling questions about that. Um, and hopefully uh, we go into some new areas, but also I'm sure are gonna repeat some really important themes. If you can, as mentioned, though you don't have to, uh, if you wanna list your name in addition to your affiliation, that'd be great. Um, if you do raise your hand and have a comment, um, please mention again your name and where you're from just so we can learn about each other a little more. We'd love, I know this isn't always possible, but if possible, if you could keep your camera, cameras on, That'd be great, but we understand sometimes dogs, kids, et cetera, genomes are running across the uh, the screens. So it might not be possible. Um, please do try to keep on mute if you can. We have a you know a, a great group of, of folks that are helping that will try to put you on mute if again your dog or genome is barking in the background. But try to keep on mute unless you're unless you're um, making a point. I will ask if we could try to focus on the discussion that we're going to have here on the Zoom screen versus in the chat. You're welcome to use the chat. Uh, we have actually folks from extramural NHRI that are going to help monitor the chat and are going to help um, respond to, for example, questions about funding opportunities. Uh, but we want to have maybe not two totally separate parallel discussions here, one in chat, one on the screen. Try to direct your attention uh, to the screen if you, if you could. Um, we've outlined a set of questions that we'll show you after Dr. Green presents the introduction or the welcome. Uh, if we stick with those questions, great. If we go, quote unquote, off script, that's great, too. We just want to take this in whatever direction you feel is most valuable to you and to the field. Uh, I do want to mention that we'll have one more, our third in this set of sessions uh, on August 29th. That's going to be co-moderated. Uh, I'll be with Shamita Dasgupta from Boston University uh, in a couple weeks. Again, you're welcome to come to that, but we're hoping people will have attended only at least one. And then last but not least, I do hope these sessions run smoothly. I think we're all used to lots of Zoom and virtual type glitches. So my preemptive apologies, if we have some technical difficulties, we'll do our best to avoid those or deal with them if they come. So with that, I am delighted to turn to Dr. Eric Green, the director of NHGRI for his uh, welcome and opening remarks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, so welcome all of you. Uh, some of you I know, some of you I don't know as well. Um, we think this is a really important set of discussions that I actually asked uh, Ben and others at the Institute to convene 
so that the institute could learn more about the cur current circumstance with the clinical genetics and genomics workforce as been defined. And that includes laboratory clinical geneticists as well as classic medical geneticists. Um, I, I will say now having um, been the director of NHGRI for almost 14 years, I'm always profoundly um, grateful and, um, and flattered that when we invite people and ask them to donate some of their time to us um, as an institute, people come. And I think it's a testament to the field. I would like to think it's also a testament to the institute that people are willing to give their time and help us brainstorm um, and hoping that if we get good ideas, we will improve the field uh, by the work that we do. So why are we here today? Well, I don't need to tell this audience that the field of genetics and genomics is changing quickly. Um, there's unprecedented opportunities um, for genomic medicine implementation. We've seen rapid areas of accelerated growth when it comes to technologies for sequencing genomes, analytical tools for analyzing such data, better and better technologies, including long read DNA sequencing technologies, and on the horizon are new opportunities for genome editing and hopefully gene therapy. And all these have great potential for clinical implementation. And I can't tell you how profoundly honored NHGRI is to be able to help facilitate these areas reaching their full potential. But at the same time, while there seems to be this incredible opportunity for clinical laboratory geneticists and medical geneticists, there's just a lot going on. I think some of it relates to industry consolidation, artificial intelligent approaches, and various things going on that might influence how people are making decisions about their career. And so, to be honest with you, we need to recognize that we have a lot of challenges. For example, uh, we all know that there aren't enough physicians going into medical genetics training programs and that many hospitals and clinics have a hard time recruiting experts in these areas. And this has many consequences, not the least of which is that it creates issues related to access and equity, something the Institute passionately is concerned about. So we've had a lot of discussions at NHGRI um, related to the workforce, various aspects of the genetics and genomics workforce, um, including uh, scientists and, and other, other career opportunities in genomics. But that's not what we're going to focus on here. Uh, these discussions, as you heard from Ben, we're going to have three of them this summer. They just seek to get a better handle on the barriers that seem to exist why more people aren't going into medical genetics and laboratory genetics as a, a career option and to see whether there's something that NHGRI could do. Unlikely we would do it alone, because we know there's a number of organizations working hard on this. Some of them are joining us today. And our staff is having discussions with leaders of the full set of letters that, that Ben went through, ABMGG, ACMG, APHMG, ASHG, EIEIO, and so forth. And those conversations are terrific. And we absolutely don't want to, and will aim not to step on anybody's toes here, but we just want to know, can we be helpful? We want to make sure that NHGRI can partner with anybody else in this in this uh, universe that will help us understand um, these workforce issues and work with us to see if we can improve them. And you know, we also know there's another aspect of this is we know it's really critical to recruit and train a more diverse workforce uh, to serve the country and the world. And so in addition to just the size of the workforce, we want to thinking we want to be thinking a lot about its diversity. Now, we delved into many of these issues in the 2020 NHGRI strategic vision, which is our latest strategic vision. Um, and like many parts of that strategic vision, we are involved in ongoing efforts to hear what the community has to say that are barriers or desired strategies or concrete actions that we can take. Sometimes that involves money, sometimes that involves leadership, sometimes that involves arm twisting, sometimes it involves convening. So tell us what we can do. And so that's the charge. And with, I don't want to take up any more time. I'm going to turn this over to Ben and Deb, who will co-moderate the discussion with you today. Uh, thanks to Deb and Ben for, for doing that and for helping organize this. And thanks to all of you again for joining. I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you, ben. Thanks so much, Eric. That was that was great. And uh, again, thanks to everybody for joining. I can see our numbers still ticking up. Um, I'm always shocked and surprised when anybody shows up. 
but uh, but uh, obviously this is very important uh, to uh, to the whole community. Um, Deb, do you want to start? I don't know if you're you're fancy and technologically savvy enough, unlike me, perhaps to do the poll part. Uh, or if not, we have lots of other folks that can help. But can you guys? Can everybody see the poll? So it's only two questions. We we're, we're easy people. First, did you attend our prior geneticist workforce session on July seventeenth? And do you plan to attend the next one? We're trying to figure out if this is a one-time deal, so we're gonna, we'll do more breadth, or if a lot of people were here the first one and doing the third one, we might do more depth today. So we're trying to figure out how to focus the, the discussion. I'll give it, I'm gonna count to five because I can. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I, I always, I, I love seeing my results. Do you guys love seeing the results too, like me probably? So most of you were not here last time. So welcome. We're glad you decided to come join us. Ben and I love to have you together with us. And it's about 50-50 if people will be joining next time. So great. So I think we're going to kind of start at the basics, Ben. So for the few of you who were here last time, the, the fourth of you, don't worry. You might have thought about some things or might want to bring up some things that were brought up last time too. So I'll let you go ahead and put up the questions, Ben. Good. So I'm going to share. Thanks so much. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, very interesting to see who had been here or not. We weren't, we weren't sure how it was going to turn out. Um, I'm just going to briefly flash the agenda screen, uh, not the agenda screen, I'm sorry, the question screen now um, up here. These are the questions that you should have received uh, in the invite emails. And, and thank you for bearing with me as I sent you lots of invite emails to make sure nobody missed them. Um, but these are the four main topics that Wendy Chung, Deb, who's obviously with us today, and then Shamita Dasgupta, that we came up, uh, that we thought might be interesting to address. And so uh, Deb's gonna go through them with you. In turn, I'll be acting more as a behind the scenes, but I'm and kind of figuring out if there's stuff in the chat to bring to the forefront. Um, again, I want to emphasize if we stick with these and devote equal time to them, that's great. If we only go through one of them because that's where you want to spend your time, that's great too. This was just more of a set of menu options versus a required script. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing these um, that I haven't written down in front of me. Um, and uh, Deb, you want to take us into the, the questions? If that's yeah, right? so I, I feel like sometimes, um, I know we're supposed to keep it on the screen, but there will be some things that if you, you can't talk where you are, if you want to put in the chat, we're gonna uh, kind of capture the information in the chat as well. Let's start and spend about five minutes on the first question. I know that there's more than five minutes worth of barriers to um, kind of what are the barriers to helping our, our field grow. Um, but I'm gonna start with about five minutes of that discussion and we could talk a hundred hours on that, I know, but we're gonna try to focus because I would love us to get to some strategies and some brainstorming also today. So what, what do we think are some of our leading barriers well, you get to take yourself off mute. You can raise your hand. You can put it in the chat. I can even tell Ben to give us one or two from last time. I see, Peter, you took yourself off mute, so I bet you have something to say. So barriers are several. One is uh, uh, salaries for uh, clinicians. The second is um, the definition of what the specialty is. And we've defined ourselves into a corner, which is basically a specialty of rare disorders, and that's how we've taught it for years. Um, I think we've made genetics a subspecialty in medicine. I think that medicine is a subspecialty in genetics, and the sooner we can get to that point, uh, the better off we're going to be, and it means changing the way education works in our medical schools and others. And the, the last is inclusion of other specialties as opposed to making it a, uh, trying to make it a subspecialty uh, that cardiology you... and others would be within genetics or related to genetics rather than really tempting to uh, include everybody. Can you explain that last one to me a little bit more? So the idea that kind of within cardiology or neurology, they would have more genetic training and be able to do the yeah. work? Or do you mean that yeah. there'd be more like neurogeneticists who would be trained in neuro and then become a geneticist? Well, I think that the training should start in medical school to begin with. And, it, and I mean, we, for example, at the University of Washington have eliminated genetics as a standalone course uh, as we get small groups with the expectation that the clinicians who are helping with small groups will have enough genetic back, genetics background to um, integrate uh, the discussion. They don't. Uh, the only people who do, as far as I can tell, are people who are either actively working in genetics or who are genetics, geneticists themselves. And so mm -hmm. really going back to models where 
we think about genetics in all contexts as we are, as we're teaching in medical schools, um, and that that then gets incorporated into the further training. And I think, you know, I really think that the idea that uh, medicine is a subspecialty of genetics is, a, is an idea worth considering. And I know it's hard to implement, but I, I think that if we uh, make it a more major part of training, then we don't have to deal with cardiologists having to take genetic specialties and do that sort of stuff, but really make it an integrated area. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I'm going to go to David and then Catherine. Go ahead, David. <clears throat> this is probably a long list. I think one of the things that comes to mind, though, is, is that there's just not that much exposure of medical learners to geneticists. You just don't see, you get a lot of, you see a lot of cardiology consultants and neurology consultants and et cetera as you go along, and you don't have somebody modeling the profession to you. So you don't really think of it even as an option or see what they do to get excited about it um, during the course of training. Yeah, and I, I would say, Adam, that that's being some of the chat is exposure, right? Like you don't you don't know you can be something you've never seen. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead, Catherine. Thanks. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think could be really helpful is um, some somehow advocating for more GME funding for genetics residencies. Um, we, you know, uh, so mm -hmm. most people on this call know that we have a categorical genetics residency program, and then combined programs that also include pediatrics or internal medicine training. Um, and the pool of applicants, I'm program director for both of those at University of Michigan, the pool of applicants is actually really strong for the combined programs. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, potentially there are more, more applicants that would consider it as a field if there were more training positions available. I think right now maybe there are like 27, I'm guessing. Actually, Mimi would probably know this. Um, uh, positions available. So if we were able to advocate for more GME funding at various institutions, I think that that could be um, something that would really help out. Go ahead, Mimi. Do you want to comment on what you Yeah, um, I'll just I'll just comment that there are uh, right now 27 combined PEDS uh, genetics programs. There aren't enough, I don't know if it's my bias, in internal medicine genetics. Um, and part of that has been the challenge with the integration with the internal medicine departments and funding. So I agree. I think there are more funded positions. There are that many programs. We're all hearing those that the applicant pool is strong. I do think that that's one way. I do think that for some prior comments that were made about exposure in med school and the like may increase even our categories as well, but it's not there right now. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mustafa. Yeah. So I completely agree with uh, with the discussion points. I think that um, it's no longer limited to just internal medicine or or pediatrics. I mean, a lot of other specialties are very uh, strongly involved in in genetics. Either it's uh, it's genetic testing, um, sometimes with genetic counselors or without, and then also. Um, developing some of uh, these novel treatments in patients. I mean, you can think of like ophthalmology. They are in, in very advanced stage uh, doing gene therapy in a lot of inherited diseases. Right. So I think the way to do it will be to increase the, uh, um, the spectrum of these combined programs, not just limit them to certain like uh, traditional specialties and others. So then it will be attractive to uh, medical students knowing that they're going to be uh, you know, in that specialty, but also uh, in genetics. The other point we noticed during the uh, the interview is some there, there are very strong applicants um, for the the residency programs, and some of them are very research oriented. And I think you know, we, I think we should find ways of uh, having dedicated year or years for uh, the training during genetics, so they can become like physician scientists, and those people can really contribute to developing novel treatments uh, in, in these conditions that, that we deal with. Yeah. So I have a, a lot of, I guess, follow-up questions from the last couple speakers, but let me let me limit it to a couple um, just to make sure I understand. So Mustafa and Catherine, it sounds like what you were advocating for are more an emphasis on more creating or expanding more combined spots in programs versus 
putting more emphasis on the traditional categorical one? Is that where the quote unquote money is or where the opportunity is? Absolutely, in my opinion, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and that's been the conversation at APHMG the last several years that's come up too. Yeah, so, go ahead, Maria. Can I, I have two thoughts. One is because I came from internal medicine to genetics, salary is a big thing because genetics is a fellowship, it's a second residency. We already have to have some previous training before. I did three years of internal medicine and then did genetics and my potential income was cut in half. I did four years more of fellowship to make half the money that I could have been making if I stayed in internal medicine. So that is a hard sell for a lot of people that have a lot of student loans, that have a lot of things. And many of our friends who have come and done an specialty before, like OBGYN, neuro, whatever, they are practicing that primary specialty. With a focus in genetics, they are not practicing genetics because that is just not realistic. And my experience also as an IMG is these combined programs are out of reach for anybody who has not graduated from the United States. I was lucky to find an opportunity at the NIH because the NIH was one of the few fellowship programs when I applied, this was 12 years ago, so maybe things are different now, um, that accepted visas and that could sponsor me to come to do a fellowship like that when I was just coming out of internal medicine. So you keep increasing these combined spots, but those are highly selective, only given in a few universities, not all of them sponsor visas, and then you're limiting your pool. You're not gonna have a more diverse pool because you're excluding a huge chunk of us. Great, thanks Maria. Other comments? So I, I feel like a lot of what we've talked about is, um, can I make a comment? Yeah, of course. Even. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to comment that Dr. Taken commented that we need more research spots. And I actually think that that's a deterrent for some medical students. Medical students a lot want to be practicing medicine and they think of genetics as a very heavily research-based, lab-based field. And I'm not sure that's not a deterrent. I was going to make the same comment or a similar comment um, that I think a lot of folks think that if you're going to genetics, you have to have like a PhD background or you have to have a bench research background or you want have to want to be a physician scientist or have that in your future. Um, and I think it's really important for us to make students aware that there are other paths. And of course, genetics is an academic specialty for the foreseeable future, but there are ways to be a geneticist that don't involve doing clinical trials or doing a lot of research um, that may be a better fit for certain people. And I think that might be a deterrent. And, and I would piggyback that with, uh, there are many university settings where you can be a uh, clinical educator. And so that would solve our issue of having geneticists who are involved with residents and with students and having an example for people to, um, to model to then want to go into genetics. Thanks, Edith and Chair. I agree with both of you. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. You have your hand up. So one of the reality points that we have to deal with is that we train about 60 medical geneticists, the MDs, DOs, et cetera, in a year. And we're training 550 genetic counselors a year. So the total number of genetic counselors that's out there now is closing in on 10,000. The number of medical geneticists hasn't changed since we developed the board. It's about between 13 and 1,500 people. So there's no, there's been no rise. There's been no uptake of genetics as a profession among medical students, and a tremendous rise among people in genetic counseling. So you know we've seen genetic counselors come into into play in the large companies uh, at least for a while until they got a little bit stressed in terms of their finances. Uh, they're very active in all the academic programs around the country. Um, they are, uh, in many cases, at least as knowledgeable as our trainees coming in because they've been there for longer. 
They're a real resource in terms of practicing medicine, but we have to change uh, a number of things that has to do with that. So the bill that's been lagging in Congress about making geneticists eligible for compensation through uh, Medicare really needs to be pushed uh, despite uh, opposition I gather from the ACMG, which seems irrational. Um, but I think that we're still at the point of, I mean, I think, you know, I agree we get much better candidates in the combined programs. Um, they do well. Um, they have insight into what's going on. Can we create combined programs throughout or make some something combined with all the other training programs as we're going along and make genetics a significant part of training? We've had remarkable success with an unusual group of people like vascular surgeons and cardiac surgeons in terms of realizing the benefit of genetics and what they do. And I think we need to be really thinking more directly about who's going to be part of it and assuming that everybody will be, not assuming that you know, we can't make ourselves an insular specialty. We have to be uh, you know, we have to be part of the DEI and the inclusion part of the I uh, as part of that. And it doesn't mean welcoming them to our table. It means going to their table. I'm going to go to Matthew next, and then we're going to move on to a little bit more delving a tiny bit more into the role of the future geneticist. We've kind of touched on that, but I want to go there after Matthew's comment. Thanks, uh, Matt Taylor from University of Colorado, Internal Medicine Genetics. I agree with, with your comments there, Peter, and was sort of going to raise and lower my hand because I'm a little hesitant to sort of to say this out loud. <laughs> I'll say it anyway. Um, I think, a, I don't know if it's a barrier or a challenge or how we want to face it, but at least in the in medicine world, it really seems to be that we're losing the the battle around what a geneticist is because what I'm, what I'm hearing from my colleagues is it's just someone who orders genetic testing. Oh, and by the way, that's really easy to do. And by the way, most of those genes that are gonna be looked at for gene therapy are just gonna require a test, someone to hopefully somewhat correctly interpret it some of the time, and then someone who's not a geneticist will order the gene therapy. I don't know how we address that necessarily because obviously testing is expanding to your comments about counselors expanding and, and likely at some point being able to bill for services and probably order genetic tests when in many cases they have to be tied to a provider. But I don't know how we collectively address that issue, that the thing that we do that no one else could do, which was like, read and remember what was in those textbooks, <laughs> is now gone because essentially what we do and what is perceived we do is we just drag our feet and take a long time to see somebody and then order a test. And so I don't know how we kind of address that. And again, this is not a comment, um, you know, against the NIH or anything, but we are a little bit of a victim of the successes with what's happened with all this sequencing technology that has been generated and driven out there. And so if we're only training 60, 65 of us a year, guess what? We're not ordering the lion's share of genetic testing. We never will be ordering that lion's share. And somehow we've got to figure out how to pull some of that back potentially because we really at the moment are just the people who take longer than everybody else to order the damn test. Matt, I think I'm going to steal that line. I think it was something like we drag our feet and uh, then order some tests <laughs> for, uh, for future talks. That's a depressing yeah, I, I, it, it, You can put it on a t-shirt, something shorter, <laughs> something like that. I don't know. It, it, doddering around and then getting around to ordering the <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Right. For Look that. for the booth at ASHG, I guess. Right. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to go to Melissa because she had her hand up and it came up in the middle of that. So I think that <laughs> might have spiked something in you. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Melissa Dempsey and I, I, I'm a genetic counselor. However, I work at Illumina, so I haven't done genetic counseling in some time, but I uh, used to work in clinic. Um, and actually, I work in the marketing department at Illumina. So through what you were, the last couple of people were saying, I feel like maybe the geneticist needs a, a new branding um, exercise uh, to kind of rebrand what a geneticist is. And I, I do think some has gotten lost in this battle between the genetic counselor and the geneticist that I feel like has been going on since I was trained 20 years ago. Um, and instead of focusing on what you both do, which I think there is overlap, um, focus on what is unique. And I think, I mean, as geneticists, you go to school for a long time to be physicians and and you can manage and prescribe and, and treat patients. And now we're at such an exciting time where there's treatments that it's like, wow, if I go back to medical school, like being geneticist is super fun right now because there's, there's some treatments coming up and, 
and genetic counselors can't do that at all. And so I think um, I would love to see more collaboration between the two and figuring out, um, you know, how to work. Uh, I was part of a working group recently, and there was a quote that somebody said, um, you know, figuring out how to uh, work at the top of our scope and not just side by side next to each other in clinic. Um, you know, each person doing the thing they do best um, at their point by themselves in the room. And, and I can speak just quickly of my history. I started out as a pediatric genetic counselor. And a lot of genetic counselors, you say there's 550 a year. I would wonder how many work in pediatrics. Um, they've moved into areas like o, um, OB, cancer, oncology, and industry because they get a little more autonomy and like one-on-one -on -one time and independence. Um, so I think if, if there's a role for them in pediatrics that does give them that autonomy and then give you the chance to be, you know, treating the patients and interpreting the tests and the things that I think the genetic counselors aren't as, um, don't have that medical background, uh, would be great. Thanks, Melissa. We're going to go to Susan next. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm sorry I came in late. I was actually seeing patients with genetic counselors. Um, I work in a, in a large reproductive and cancer group, and I work with eight genetic counselors. Um, my life would be a lot easier if they were paid independently. The problem with the bill is that the genetic counselors right out of school want to be paid 85% of what a physician gets paid for without working in a team. And as many of you know, most of this is team-based um, uh, team based care now and multidisciplinary care. The bill, if you read um, the wording, um, has genetic counselors practicing as physicians. And AMA is, is not supportive and we're members of the AMA as um, part of ACNG. I agree with, I'm sorry, I think it was Melissa Dempsey with what she said. We should both be practicing at the top of our scope. And um, I agree with what a lot of people said, and I think this has been repeated at ACMG, APHMG, at, at, at a lot of different things about working. The combined programs clearly have the best um, applicants, and it would be wonderful if we could have more. I'm doing my own uh, part and um, starting the application. I just have to wait until um, I have a pediatric uh, colleague to help. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands ACMG is not against genetic counselors getting paid, but they have to, that the bill, the way it's worded now, um, is not going to get support of AMA, and most medical bills without the support of AMA do not um, pass. So um, there's a lot of issues because licensure in multiple states is different, et cetera. Um, I'm happy to discuss it with anyone. Um, I am trying to work with many of my genetic counselor colleagues to get something passed so we can all work together. Um, I, there are only 56, 20, 5,629 certified genetic counselors now. We may get up to 10,000 soon, but as someone who um, uh, trains the genetic counselors right out of school from Sarah Lawrence, one of the top programs in the country, the genetic counselors right out of school should not be practicing independently. Maybe after a few years, the genetic counselors who see cancer patients can be practicing independently, but they're not really practicing independently because an oncologist sent the patient to them. Um, and same thing mostly with prenatal. So I think that you know a lot of the um, issues came from the worry of um, genetic counselors ordering exome in the peds um, in the peds world. Dr. Byers just said, can you send the text of the bill to all of us? I'm gonna have to, log I'm on my phone, but it, if you, I think it's 1415, I'll, I'll look for it and I'll, if you just Google it, you'll, you can see it. Um, by the way, it was put um, up for adoption or pro promote, I forgot what the word is in the Congress, by someone who didn't know what a genetic counselor is. So it was the ACMG folks who advised this person about the value of a genetic counselor. So um, I know, and I've spoken to people in NSGC. It 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 definitely um, is uh, would be valuable for all of us. Oh, thank you, um, Matt. Thank Taylor, you, Matt. Put it up. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Yeah. So let's talk for a, a minute more. Oh, Joan, I see your hand up, and then I want to talk a little bit more hey, about Chaya, what should has, her up, has has her hand up as well, or oh, maybe it's a legacy you. hand. Sorry. Um, my comment goes back a little bit earlier, but I'll be quick about it. 
Yeah, I think it was Melissa. So I forgot to introduce myself. I'm a pediatric geneticist at Baylor. Um, I think Melissa had said, you know, or somebody had said, we need kind of a rebranding of geneticists that we also treat and we can do gene therapies. I think one of the challenges is that a lot of the departments are not set up for that structure with that infrastructure and that support yet. So that would require a lot of changes at the institutional level as well. Um, I don't practice metabolism and I know in metabolism, there's usually more of a robust kind of support structure. But if I were to start having to treat lysosomal patients or whatever it might be in my clinic, we would need a lot more infrastructural support. And I think that would be something that needs to change across the board. Great point, Chad. thanks. Go ahead, Joan. Sorry, I can't get my video to work. I don't know why. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> um, I was there's a lot of stuff in the chat about um, uh, you know what do what do um, the, the residency programs and I was gonna say I trained in peds and then I went into genetics. Um, so I think a big problem with going right into genetics is if you are end up at a small institution like I am in Syracuse, you need a medical home and it's you know I'm in peds. The other geneticist who's with me is trained in internal medicine, but we're in the department of peds. And sometimes our, I mean, we have so such a huge backlog that we've just now stopped seeing adults, period. You know, and it could have been a similar problem if I was in an O, you know, I was in an OB department when I first came out, and there were certain patients I couldn't see because OB said, well, why should I pay you to see them? So you know, it's tough because if you come right out of genetics and you don't go into a department of genetics, you have to find a home in some other department. Well, and I think from the conversation today, our home being internal medicine might help the salary structure. Part of it is that our homes are in pediatrics and the expectation of salaries are different in peds than they are internal medicine. So, Susan, I see your hand still up. I, I, I don't know if you meant it to be up or not, though. Okay. Well, she knows how to unmute and interrupt me. Okay, role of the geneticist. We haven't gone there much, and then we're going to move to strategies. Anything else about what you envision? Or like, how how am I supposed to be spending my time in ten years? And as part of that, I've heard. I guess I, I just mentioned in, in monitoring the chat, lots of discussions, and several of you mentioned more about management, kind of echoing things that biochemical mm -hmm. geneticists yeah. do. What are, are is that the main? future, one of the main future roles, and I was wondering if people could expand on some of those points about, is that feasible? What would it take? And so on and so forth. Yeah, Catherine? Yeah, so I'm really lucky. And so I also, um, another role that I have is I'm the division director of med uh, pediatric genetics at University of Michigan. And I have, um, I'm fortunate to have several incredible faculty members who are super enthusiastic about bringing treatment into medical gen or pediatric or medical genetics as a specialty. And, um, you know, so implementing not just treatment for biochemical disorders, but for things like vasoratide for achondroplasia. And I can't remember the name of the treatment, but the new one for Rett syndrome and bringing all those treatments in and having genetics as the home for those patients. Um, another thing that we're trying to do is, is um, start a gene therapy service line that would be, um, you know, at our institution. So we're trying to actually work with the business school to develop a business plan for this um, with the hope that we can bring this in and have geneticists as the sort of point people for delivering gene therapy services here. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, we've always been the, the diagnosticians, right? And I think that that is a role that we will always serve, but um, as we get more into the cardiologist ordering the ge genetic testing, the neurologist ordering their genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera, I think that in order for genetics to survive, we need to move into treatment and own that as a specialty. Mm -hmm. How are you doing it with the business model? So I, I've heard from some places that's the hard part is you know, yeah, I'll let you know in about a year um, in, or in uh, eight months. Person. We're, we're um, we've actually got a proposal in um, for um, a team of executive MBA students to bid on a project to help us develop that model. So I'll let you know how it turns out. Yeah, Cynthia, your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree with the idea that we need to emphasize um, the role of geneticists and treatment of patients. And I think that's something where the training programs need to 
you know, expand. Um, and, you know, part of that will be some of the requirements that come from ACGME to, to do that. Um, you know, it's nowhere really in the milestones that I'm aware of to really say that, you know, students, trainees have had experience in, in clinical trials or gene therapy. And I, I think that, you know, we shouldn't give all those away to other providers. Um, you know, uh, possibly, you know, we're not gonna be doing gene therapy for um, eye diseases, but um, although we can train those ophthalmologists to be geneticists also, but um, yeah, I think, you know, we need to find a way to um, emphasize that part of our uh, scope of practice. Yeah, go ahead, David. Sorry, unmuting. So I'm a little bit of two minds about the whole treatment thing because often the what you're treating is some falls well within somebody else's specialty. You know, do you expect vision to get better, epilepsy to get better, renal function to get better? And I think although I can imagine us being part of a team, it's um, taking it over entirely. Uh, I guess I'd have to think a little bit more about how that might work. I guess one thing that I haven't seen coming up much, and I realize the laboratories have taken this over to a large extent, but is the the use of genomics data as a lifelong resource um, for healthcare, including reanalyzing data. Uh, you know, the radiologists interpret MRIs, which are orders of magnitude less complex than the genome. I mean, I think that there there should be a role for us to engage with that data set and connect it to the, the patient's healthcare in a way that we haven't pursued as a field. And we've ceded it to a large extent to testing laboratories that are very sort of, in many cases, narrow in their approach to how they use it. Yeah. Matt? Uh, to to your comment, David, I I, I have the same struggle with um, where this sort of fits in terms of what we can do, and I agree that it's going to be difficult for me to walk into pulmonary clinic and say, "Hey, newsflash, CF is genetic. Step aside, I'm going to manage all this." I completely agree with that. On the other hand, I think we have to acknowledge that we're not doing a very good job training our trainees to do uh, gene therapies and enzyme-based therapies and some of these novel therapies, RNA-based in our own sort of ultra rare specialty field. And I think that we should lay claim to that, even though we probably won't necessarily lay claim to CF for sure, probably a lot of the eye diseases, understandably, based on the mode of injection. But I think we could do a better job. And unfortunately, that's gonna be training some of us on this call, many of whom I suppose have had some exposure to gene therapy, others myself nearly, but not quite dosed anybody yet. So we'd have to train our sort of discipline and then help move that in a direction. That'd be pretty exciting to medical students to be able to probably do some of this stuff. But I think you know, traditionally, you know, we as geneticists outside of metabolic disease have really been sort of the stand back at the back of the room and say, here's the diagnosis from 50 feet. That's pretty impressive. Um, and we have to shift a little bit to where we actually get more involved in those trials. As we're involved in a trial right now, but it's it's a cardiomyopathy trial. And it's pretty clear that the sponsor is really looking for cardiologists. Um, you know, we've done some of the seminal research in this space, but they're looking for cardiologists to run that trial. And we need to figure out a way of flipping the script for these rare diseases that ultimately do fit with what we do. So Matt, I want to bring up, a, I guess, something that I'll, I'll, I can't take any credit for. Wendy Chung, who is the previous co-moderator, just in some discussions behind the scenes mentioned this. And I'm just curious if the group agrees with this or not. Um, uh, but I think it's there's some, a lot of neat things here. Is there's obviously lots of genetics to go around, meaning there are many different people affected by genetic conditions, whether they're managed by a pulmonologist or a cardiologist. Her thought, which which I personally agree with, but I'm curious again about what the group thinks, is that you know the niche for geneticists could be these multi-system disorders that a renal doctor isn't going to take on because you know they love the kidney, but they don't want the other pieces, or a pulmonologist is going to take the lung does that is there enough to go around to that are there are the treatments promising enough for that or will that not work for other reasons that that folks can think of i i will just say since you i was just the last one speaking that'll work in some circumstances in other circumstances things may get seeded away and so 
you know, who's taking care of Pompe disease these days? It's mostly neurologic, so a lot of neurologists are involved. Fabry disease, which is multi-system, is kind of across the board. There are some places where it's genetic, some places it's more nephrology. I think we're going to have to pick and choose to some degree. But the more common disorders that have sort of got their own clinics, got their own space, even if they're multi-system, we may be already, that, that may be already cats out of the bag, so to speak. But there are, you know, thousands of, of rare disorders, many of them that, you know, I'll admit I haven't heard of all of them, of course, so many of them that are cresting the horizon with possible therapies, we're probably best suited to take those ultra rare things, uh, especially if they're polysystem diseases as well. Um, we might need help from colleagues in managing some of this for sure, but we should, I think, step up and be more on that therapeutic front line for the, at least the, the rare and ultra rare stuff, I think, but maybe others disagree. I'm going to comment back to you, Matt. Now I'm commenting as a commenter, not as a, <laughs> very meta. Uh, as anything else. That you know, the reason we all do this job is because we want every patient to have access to the right tests, the right treatment, and not to be lost in the shuffle. Right, that's the point. So if the CF clinic is doing a better job than I am, take it. That's fine. I have a 13 month wait list. Let me go take care of someone who needs me. So on, on one hand, yeah, I don't want to, you know, give away what brings us money and our bottom line. I'm a chief. I, I have to get the bottom line, but I also am not going to fight with CF. I'm, I'm going to choose my battles. I'm going to go for the ultra rare. Great. Let me be ultra rare. Can I bring a different perspective here? Yeah, um, there are like, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning too. Um, I am a clinical and molecular geneticist and I work at GeneDx now. Um, one of the things that we see when different outside collaborators approach us looking for patients for their trials, like the people driving the trials that develop the drugs are rarely geneticists. We are not involved in industry where the initial steps of the clinical development is happening. And when the medical directors in pharmaceutical companies have other specialties, their relationships are with those specialties. If a cardiologist is helping develop a new therapy for cardiomyopathy, they, their network is going to be with cardiologists who is going to tap to direct to drive those clinical trials in the different institutions. So it's probably going to be cardiologists. If we want to be involved in treatments, we also need to get in industry. We need to be in those roles and we need training to do that. We need training on regulatory and compliance and FDA regulations and all those things that could prepare part of our group to be as medical directors in industry and then bring it back. I mean, let me go back. Susan and uh, Julie have both noted that um, we need to take back genetics at the level, at the medical school level. And I, I think that that's really true. I, I think fiddling at the, you know, once you get to the fingertip, which is uh, something of what we're talking about, that is that we're looking at the very end of the process about where we're going to get changes without bringing, coming back and making genetics a requisite part and an integral part. And in fact, I think the part of medical education, we're going to be stuck. And we're going to be stuck trying to you know, change the things that have already been put in place. And we need to introduce the language of genetics and the thinking process of genetics. I mean, I think, you know, you know, when you talk to your colleagues about things that you think differently than they do about disease mechanisms and about what, you know, how to understand diseases. It is a different process being a geneticist than it is being an internist or being any of the ologists. And it's a very, very um, integrative uh, language. Um, it's applicable to every ology out there. Um, and it really should become a very strong basis of how medical learning is done. And I think we need to really get it back and you know, recapture. Uh, I'm not sure how to do it. I think we've seen some people like Rochester um, uh, has done a good job at getting it very much part of the curriculum. Hopkins with Dave Valley, 
uh, really tried to make it happen there. There's still always been a lot of pushback. But I think that if we if we can get that operational thing going, a lot of the rest of it will flow and will work more easily. But without that, I think we're sort of, you know, dealing at the end of the process, and that's very difficult to change. I think, you know, to have cardiology, to have cardiac surgeons talk about as has happened here, that we should be testing everybody who comes in the door is a remarkable transformation of that specialty uh, from somebody that, uh, you know, we think of as plumbers as opposed to think about thinking about how genetics fits into their specialty. And we should be seeing that in every single specialty. And uh, we provide the language for doing it, I think. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, we're going to go next to you. And then I don't know if, if Marin, if you're in a place where you can unmute yourself after Tracy speaks, but I was wondering if you might mind, wouldn't mind expanding on this medical home idea, which I think is interesting in addition to some of the direct treatments like gene therapy. But please, Tracy, please go ahead. So I'm a medical educator at uh, Florida International University. Um, I do not have a clinical practice. FIU does not have a genetics residency. And so our students are really left, you know, with nothing unless I'm really pushing super duper hard. And I, I push really hard, but what about all of those other medical schools? We have 150 plus medical schools in this country and we don't have near that many residencies. And so what are we doing to, um, uh, to get attention to genetics in those places where there is no clinical geneticist and there is no genetics residency? We've got to be paying attention to them as well. So I, for the last, I know we only have a few minutes left. I don't know if, if Maren's able to talk a little bit about the medical home comment that she put in, which I thought was very interesting. Um, the thing that I want to have us spend at least a little bit of time, and I'm going to conflate a couple questions into one, are, and I've seen a lot of this in chat, so folks can just mention this verbally to make sure we don't miss key points. So what do we what do? We do now? And, I, and I'm going to ask this in two ways. This is what I'm conflating. One is, what do we do to concretely get more of genetics into medical education or to steal Peter's phrase, take back, I think Peter is what you said, you know, take back genetics education. Are there concrete things that we should be thinking about doing and ways to address that? That's number one. And then much more parochially and boringly, what should the next steps after this third session on August 29th be? How should we continue this conversation? How do we get the group to keep working on this issue instead of just leaving the Zoom issues with a lot of these Zoom meetings with a lot of ideas, but not necessarily next steps? And so I am uh, would love for folks to just talk about what our next step should be, both to improve things and just to keep the conversation going in the last couple of minutes. So I'm going to start because no one put their hand up. And I saw a comment saying, you know, we're getting this pressure. We, we can't even get into the first two years of med school. I'm going to be blunt with all of you. I have three med schools in my area. And everyone said, we're going to keep having you come because our students like you. You tell the best stories. They get that biochem is meaningful because of you. We're going to keep an hour for you. And I was like, cool, keep an hour for me. I'll be there. This idea of can we, can we help our trainees teach better? Can we be the best stories? Can we be the ones that show the application every day? We have the best stories on the planet, right? But I think sometimes unless we get in there and then do an outstanding job, we're not going to keep the spot in med schools. I, guess I just tell stories. I would follow up that question to everybody again and, and, and to you. When I look at the maps, I think it's that Jenkins et al. article in Genetics and Medicine from the 2019 survey. It shows, as you'd expect, the academic corridors, their geneticists there, and yeah. hiring geneticists, right? But we don't see a lot in certain other parts of the country, let alone other countries. So I guess the other question, I think going back to Tracy's comment, how do we get exposure? How do we get exposure to the places that, you know, might not be connected to Children's National or to some of the other folks, places where, where folks are. Yeah. So the um, I, I'll comment that there is a move within National Organization for Rare Disorders to have clubs at schools, at med schools. So they're now starting to ask us to come and talk. So they're getting the CF centers and the sickle cell centers, but every once in a while, if they know there's a geneticist out there, you might be asked to call, even if you're on a coast, to call in. Zoom has changed. How we can get into these like specialty clubs too. Yeah. 
I think Tracy's comments about things are, are really very relevant. And that is that you, if you teach the language of genetics to medical students and you engage as part of that, the faculty, even if you don't have genetics as a specialty in the school, you teach the language and they bring that on with them and they carry it with them as they're seeing patients, as they're doing medicine. And Tracy may have the ideal situation in which to test the model. That is, get it in early and get it in hard. We only have a, a very few minutes left, so we're going to go kind of in lightning order. Uh, and if you guys could um, keep your comments maybe to a minute and a half, and then I'll sum up in three seconds at the end, but it'll go Julie. Uh, Matthew and then Catherine, if that's okay. Julie, please go ahead. So my comment was to state that we have a club for interest for med students for every single uh, possible potential pathway they should, can take after med school. And at WashU, we have one for medical genetics. And um, I have a student now who's in the interest group. And the thing is, though, that too many of the med students don't even know what we do, and it's not presented to them. So they don't have an attraction for joining this particular club, whereas the internal medicine club has a lot of, of student interest, or even general peds or OB. So um, I think we have to be there and be in their faces and teach them and be a friend to them. and tell them all of our stories. Um, and I think that is that is a really important thing. Thank you. Catherine and I will say, I like the, the vest or the fleece, Catherine, the good, uh, good, uh, good <laughs> shout out. <laughs> and I'm probably the only one wearing a sweater here. Everybody else I'm sure is very hot. I'm in San Francisco and it's kind of cold and foggy today. So I'm wearing my nice APHMG sweatshirt. But um, so to kind of follow up on some of these, these comments, I'll just say quickly that I to, to rephrase some of the, or to restate some of the things that came up in the beginning as well is we're really caught in this vicious cycle of we need clinical geneticists to be in front of the students for them to see about, you know, that this is a field, that it is a specialty in and of itself. And we need clinical geneticists to be taking a, a lead role as well as many of us PhDs in medical genetics education. But I can say at our institution, you know, the clinical geneticists are totally overwhelmed in clinic. There's a major shortage of geneticists. They don't have time to teach. So it's all put on me to do, and I'm happy to do as much as I can, but I need to have clinical geneticists involved. You need an MD to talk to MDs. Unfortunately, that's the way it goes, you know, with the to talk to the deans they really are going to hear more from, you know, from other MDs. And so we just need more clinical geneticists to be out there with time to teach and to be engaged with students. So it's kind of this vicious cycle, as I'm saying. Right. We can maybe we can start a more of a roadshow movement or, or re-engage some of what I what I heard in the chat. Um, Matthew, you're going to have the last word and then I'll sum up in about 10 seconds. So go for it. Yeah, so embracing the we're caught in the cycle part, I'll just say that I think that a lot of things that were just mentioned, get in front of med students, more teaching, more clubs and stuff. I'd argue we've probably been doing that and trying to do it for a long time as best as we can with the resources we have. And if anything, we're in a no better, possibly worse situation than we were before, in spite of our field getting much more interesting and excited. So I would just caution us to say that you know we're a small group with limited bandwidth I don't know if, if we've done it long enough to test the question of can we influence change from the grassroots level of the medical school? Because um, you know, one potential you know, explanation or not answer that hypothesis is possibly not. Because for the last 20, 30 years, although we am sure had some successes globally as a group, we're flatlined in terms of new geneticists and we're having these conversations of workforce. So I, I just think that we should be sober about sort of that approach, because I, I would say I'm not sure it's worked before yep. multiple times. Yep. Yeah, thanks. I, I like that. A good way to conclude is to phrase it as a well-designed research trial or the need for that. So very briefly, I want to thank everybody for your time. I know you're incredibly busy. I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to attend this session, and maybe we'll see you next session. I got four themes from this. I just want to repeat out loud, but please go back and look at our notes and look at the um, the recorded session or share it with others. 
So money, 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 that comes up in, in all ways, shapes, and forms. The need for exposure, or I really like what Melissa said about some, perhaps some, consider some scientifically-based rebranding. Um, a, a lot of interest very concretely in com combined programs and the potential that's there to bring more people and people from other specialties. And then finally, um, a lot of discussion on the move, I wanted to say from diagnosis, but to include diagnosis as well as a lot of the therapeutic uh, and management areas, but that would include institutional requirements. With that, I know it's a poorly organized summary, but I want to thank you all again, and uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks to our whole team that made this happen, and we'll see you um, on the road, or on Zoom at least. Thanks so much.